Well, thank you guys for having me here this morning. It's a real privilege to get to be out here in Mission. I'm a youth and young adults pastor out in the Surrey Burnaby area, and I don't often get to visit other churches, and I come out here to mountain bike. I drive past here regularly, but it's great to actually get to see you guys and get to know you a little bit. You'll get to know me a little bit. I'm just going to pray before we open up the message. God, thank you so much that we get to come here and be your church, uh, that you have a word for us, that you want to continue to speak into our lives, challenge us as you show us more of who you are and who you create us to be, and call us into a deeper relationship with you and to do the work that you have for us here on this earth right now. Uh, I pray that the message this morning would be, move us in that, that you would speak through the words that I prepared, but that you would be the one speaking and guiding our hearts and our lives. In your name, amen. So the message this morning is titled, Extinguished. And the key passage is 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 3 to 5. And you might be having deja vu right now. I realized that on Friday that Brent and I thought we had uh, really coordinated, but it turned out the Holy Spirit had maybe coordinated us more. And I'm speaking another message. So I think God has us has a word for us to go a little bit deeper in the story of Elijah. So let's look at that together. Verses 3 to 5 say, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, while he himself went another day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, and he sat down under that bush, and he prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and he fell asleep. I don't know, that sounds like a pretty discouraging part of scripture. It sounds like whatever fire God might have ignited in his life, whatever spiritual fervor he had might have just burnt out. When he's like, God, can you just hit me with the fire extinguisher and just take me out of this. I'm done. And before we get into the message too much, I want us to start thinking about what being extinguished feels like. Um, and I remember a moment where I was really excited and, well, yeah. So I went to Bible college out in the prairies of Alberta. Some of you guys have been there. Some of you guys have just heard the horror stories about what winter in Alberta looks like. And they're like, it's minus 40, and your nose hairs freeze, and all this stuff. And anyways, for whatever reason, like I'd been a bit athletic in high school, but I was in university. I was studying hard. I wasn't exercising at all. And then one, at one point, I was like, I, you know what? I'm going to be a runner. I'm a runner now. I need to go for a run. And this wasn't like a sane 9 o'clock in the morning thought. This was like a 10 p.m. at night, 11 p.m. at night, like when you should be going to bed, but instead you're like, you know what, I'm a runner now. I'm going gonna, I'm I'm gonna to take care of my health. I'm a runner now. And so I put on my running clothes, and I put on some more running clothes, and I put on some more because this is the middle of Alberta, and it's minus 20 degrees. I put on my shoes, and I got like my face covered up, and I go out for a run, and I run like, I'm a runner now. And I run like maybe 5K. I'm like, okay, I'm a runner. But I, was, I went out and like ran like 10K. And then I come home, and I go to bed, and I was on fire. I was like, I'm a runner. This is my thing now. This is who I am. I was so full of life. And then I wake up the next morning, and you ever wake up and you go, what, what happened to my life? Did I get paralyzed in my sleep? I don't think I can move. And I hobble to class, and my friends look at me, and they're like a little worried about me, and they're like, what happened to you? And I was like... Well, I was a runner, and I'm done. I quit. I'm out. <laughs> Never again. And you might not have uh, tried what I tried, but there's probably been a point in your life when you were excited for something. You got, like, maybe you're a mature adult now and you never get excited about anything, but there was probably a time when you were a kid, at least, that you got really excited about something. And you were like, this is my hobby. I'm going to get all the sports equipment. My parents are going to spend thousands of dollars on hockey gear for me to play one practice and quit. Or 
I don't know, something happens when guys get older and they have kids. I've started to think about it, where they're like, I'm going to be a fly fisherman. Or maybe you had a friend that went through that phase, or hopefully not a spouse that went through that phase, and they buy all the fly fishing gear. And they go out one time, and they come back 12 hours later, and it looks like they got attacked by a bear, but it was just their own fly fishing equipment. <laughs> and they put it on a shelf, and then you walk by that shelf every day, and you look, and you're like, I remember when I used to be a fly fisherman. <laughs> I'm done with that. But you probably had a moment where that happened in your spiritual life. You probably had a moment where maybe you were young and you went to a youth camp or a conference. Or maybe you're old and you're mature, and so you read a book or you listened to a podcast, and it sparked something in you. And you felt like there was kindling there already, but God just put a spark to it, and you were on fire for God. It, God ignited something in your heart, and you're going out, and you're reaching out, and you're sharing the gospel in a way that you haven't before, and with a passion that you haven't had before. God did something to light you on fire. You came back from this conference or this camp or this retreat, and you're like, I'm different. God's done so much. I've experienced him in a new way, or I've seen more of God than I've ever seen before. And maybe God worked powerfully through that fire. Maybe you led somebody to know Christ for the first time. Maybe it changed how you were with your family or in your workplace. But then the fatigue sets in. You're like, that was a great fire, but now, I don't know, it's just, I'm burnt out. I'm done. And you start to ask yourself questions of, like, was it real? Was it just an emotional experience that I had? Was it just the pastor so-and-so's preaching was so good? Or was it just that it was in that moment and I was young and I was emotional? Maybe I'm not mature because my fire went out. When we look at the story of Elijah, we see him in that moment. Because he'd had this moment of this big mountaintop experience being so on fire for God, leading a revival. But then he goes and he hides under a bush and says, God, can you just kill me? And we see a little bit more of an explanation of what happened there. If we look at verse 10 of chapter 19. Let's start in verse 9. And the word of the Lord came to him, Elijah. What are you doing here, Elijah? And I don't know about you, but I don't want God to ever be like, hey, what are you doing here, Michael? <laughs> like, if you hear the voice of God, you hope that it's not a, what are you doing here? But God comes to Elijah under the bush and says, what are you doing here, Elijah, under this bush, wishing that you would die? And Elijah replies, I have been very zealous. I have been on fire. You want to talk about being, my faith being ignited. It's been ignited for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites, though, have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. And the context, it's an amazing Bible story, but the nation of Israel had gotten off track. The king, Ahab, had married Jezebel, who was from another nation, and she brought her religion of worshiping Baal to Israel. And they had left worshiping God, and they started worshiping Israel. This is the lead-up to this moment. This is the lead-up. And so they've been worshiping Baal, and in response, God tells Elijah to go tell Ahab, the king, there's going to be a drought. There's going to be no more rain. You guys are dependent on the crops. But there's going to be no more rain until God tells me to say the word. Because you've left worshiping the God of Israel and you started worshiping the God of Baal. And King Ahab, rather than being like, you know what, okay, I don't want to drought. Um, maybe I'll make things right with God. Decides that instead the solution is to just kill off all the prophets. So they're hunting down prophets, Elijah being the chief among them. And he's getting hunted down. But that's not when Elijah runs and hides under a bush and says, God, what happened? Just take my life. I'm done. That's not when Elijah wants to retire from his career as a prophet and from his life. That's not what happens. What happens is that God tells Elijah to go and 
talk to Ahab after they've been in this drought for a while and say, let's do, let's, let's solve this. Who's the real God? The God of Israel, the God of Baal. And so they go up and they create two altars. There's the altar to Baal and all of the priests to Baal. And there's the altar to the God of Israel. And there's Elijah with that. And in the morning, they pray for fire to come down from heaven and light this offering on fire to the God of Baal. And all morning they pray and they do everything and nothing happens. And so then in the afternoon, it's Elijah's turn. And he dumps a bunch of water on it. There's a whole story. It's amazing to read through in chapter 18. But bottom line, Elijah prays for God to bring fire down. And God brings down fire. And so you see physical fire. But through that, God ignites something in the people of Israel. The people of Israel gather to watch this standoff. And when they see the fire from heaven come down, they go, wait, the God of Israel is the real God, not Baal. And so then they go, and there's a lot more prophet killing, but this time it's the prophets of Baal that are getting hunted down. And there's a revival. Elijah didn't just prove God's power. He led a revival. But when King Ahab's wife Jezebel hears about this, she says, now we really need to kill Elijah. She puts out a stronger order to get him killed. And that's when he runs into the wilderness and wishes he would die. It wasn't me where I went out and tried to be a runner and was like, oh man, this was a bad experience. I'm done. This was a success. This was like if I'd gone out to be a runner and I'd gone and won the Olympics. But then at the end of the day, there's still something wrong. and I'm exhausted. I'm burnt out. This is like if you picked up that one passion that you had when you were 10 years old and you'd gone to be world class at it. God had blessed it. God had worked powerfully through Elijah. And after God worked powerfully through him and God had done so much, then Elijah is like, I'm still getting hunted for my life. I'm exhausted. I don't have anything left in me. And he goes under this broom bush. And when I first read this passage, I thought of Moses. Because there's a moment in Moses' life when he was leading the people of Israel through the wilderness. And he was responsible for leading a few million people. And I don't know about you, I don't like leading a group of five people sometimes. Like you just try to like get your family in the car to go on a camping trip. And you decide that you're the leader in that. And then you're like, I regret being the leader in that. But he was leading a camping trip for a few million people. And he lost his temper. He got tired of it. He got angry. And he took the staff that God had given him and he struck a rock in anger to bring water out of it. And that moment of anger and rebellion against God, saying, I'm done with this, cost, Elijah, cost Moses the opportunity to go into the promised land with the people that he was leading. God said, because of your rebellion, you've been rejected. So is this Elijah's moment where Elijah did an amazing thing for God? He led a revival and then he gets upset. He gets discouraged and goes under a broom bush and says, God, just take my life. That's not what happens. He falls asleep under this broom bush and he wakes up to the smell of freshly baked bread. And there's an angel there that has baked, made a meal for Elijah. And he feeds Elijah. He got some rest, and then he got some rations. And then he falls asleep again. He doesn't go, oh, okay, I'm good, I'm good, I'm ready to go. He falls asleep again. He gets some more rest. He wakes up to another meal, gets some more rations. And then, then God says, okay, this is, this is the moment. So the angel that's been serving him food says, go up onto the mountain to meet with God. So Elijah goes up onto the mountain to meet with God. I don't know if you've ever hiked up a mountain to meet with God. I've not hiked up a mountain to meet with God. I've hiked up a mountain to look at the view. But when you hike up a mountain, you expect something epic, something amazing to happen, something to kind of wow you, give you some perspective. And he gets up there, and this rushing wind comes through. It says in the Bible that the rocks were coming off this mountain because of the wind. And you're like, whoa, I'm in awe. This must be the presence of God. But no. And then after this hurricane comes through, 
Then there's an earthquake. And you imagine the deep voice of God coming on being like, Elijah, let's, let's sort this out. No, that's not what happened. Then a fire comes through. And that's still not the presence of God. Elijah's been reminded of the power of God. He's had a reminder, but he still hasn't met God yet. And then God whispers to him. Like Pastor Brent spoke about last week, God whispers to him in the quiet and says, here's what's next. I've given you rest. And I've given you some food. I've given you some rations. And then I've given you some more rest. And then I've given you some more rations. And I just gave you a reminder of my power. So now I'm ready to renew you. Now I'm ready to move you into what I actually have for you. What's next? And this, it stands out to me that this is so different than Moses' experience of getting angry and hitting a rock and being told, there's a consequence to this. You can't enter the land. In the story of Elijah, we see how God wants to work in us because we want to think, hey, when God ignites my soul on fire, when God does something amazing through me. I go to a conference, I come back so refreshed. I listen to a sermon and I come back and I'm on fire for God and I know that God's working through my life and it's going to be different because of this. And you think, this is like a fire that's just going to keep burning. It's going to burn steady. I think of like a Yule log, which was a log that people would put in their fireplace for the Christmas season. It was a log to burn through the season. And it burns steady. And the fire that Elijah experienced made me think of growing up when my brother lit the barbecue one time. You might have seen this happen before, maybe you haven't. But sometimes you go to light a barbecue and it doesn't, the lighter doesn't work right. And so you leave it for a sec and then you go to try again. But the gas is on, so the gas builds up. And when you go to light the barbecue again, it works. But it works way too well. And a ball of fire comes out of the barbecue and you lose your eyebrows. And I think sometimes when God ignites our souls, when God ignites our life, when God wants to work through us, sometimes it's like that barbecue. We're like, I expect to just light a little fire to cook my food. And God's like, no, this is a fire ball. This is huge. Elijah was ho probably hoping that when he went to light, to like kind of prove that God was the real God, God would do it gently. And people would be like, okay, yeah, I guess Baal isn't real. Let's start following the God of Israel. And maybe, maybe it would change Ahab and Jezebel's heart. But instead, it was dramatic. There was a revival. And out of that, there were some consequences. That his life was more in, in more danger than before. Sometimes when God does something through our life, he does something so powerful through his spirit that we can't imagine it. We're like, I expect God to do a little bit, and he does a lot. And it takes a toll on us. Because for some crazy reason, God said, I want humans to be my body here on earth. I chose the church, which is broken, sinful, fallible humans, to be my body here on earth and do my work. Empowered by God's spirit, but do the work of God here on earth. And we see an amazing example of that, that in Jesus. But what you see is humans have limits. God's spirit doesn't have limits, but humans have limits. God will do things that are amazing through us, but then we're still human at the end of the day. God was working through Elijah powerfully, but then Elijah's human at the end of the day, and he's, and he's a normal, healthy human as God created him to be. And so he's scared, and he's exhausted, hiding under a bush. But because God chose to work through him, he doesn't go, oh, you burnt out, I'm done with you. Oh, I did my task, I'm done with you, you're too weak. He looks at Elijah and says, you need some rest, you need some rations, you might need a reminder of my power, and then I'm going to renew you and point you to what's next. And so when we walk through these times, where we're starting to feel burnt out in our spiritual life. We're feeling like God used to use me. God used to work through me. But now I'm not enough. I can't keep doing what God has called me to. Maybe there's a reality that God knows that. That God chose to use you knowing that you're a human. That he created you with limits. 
he knows that he's calling you to do something that's beyond those. And so in those moments of burnout, it's not an indicator that you're, not, that you're done, but it's an indicator that you need to be reignited by God. That you need to let God give you rest. Physical needs, sometimes you just need food. The people of Israel, when they came out of slavery in Egypt, they crossed through the Red Sea. They were probably excited. They were stoked. Their fire was lit. But they come through that. And they get into the wilderness. And a couple days later, the fire is out. They are angry. They are upset. They are discouraged. And they're like, God, why do you lead us here to let us starve in the wilderness? And God provided the food, the physical needs that they had. He's like, you're humans, you need food, and I led you into the wilderness where you don't have it. I'm going to give you food every day, or six days a week, for 40 years straight. Sometimes God needs to, we need to let God provide for our physical needs. When we're hitting that point of burnout, we need to say, God, I need some rations. I might, need some, I might have physical needs that I just need to bring to you and trust that you're going to provide for. When you're out in the wilderness, you don't expect food to start coming from the sky, to wake up in the morning and find manna on the ground. That's not a way that you expect. You're like, God, can you give me a job to pay the bills so I can go and get groceries from Costco? And instead, God provides in a different way than you expect. But he wants to provide for you. And sometimes you need rest. Sometimes you need, it's not about getting everything done, but it's about actually letting God give you rest. God himself on the seventh day rested to set an example for us of what he created us for. I don't know about you, but sometimes after seeing God do an amazing, powerful thing where I feel, I feel like I should trust you now, God. I saw you work in a miraculous way. I saw you change somebody's heart in a way that I could never change somebody's heart and you were working through me. I should trust you now, but I, I can't. I can't trust you to take care of me. I don't know if you've ever struggled with that, but I sure have. I've seen God work powerfully, and then I'm struggling. And it's okay to say, God, you know what? <laughs> I am a human. I need reminders sometimes. And let God actually remind you of his power, of his faithfulness. God took Mo Elijah up on the mountain to tell him what he was going to do next, give him renewal. But before he did that, he said, I can see you need a reminder. I'm going to give you a physical, clear reminder of my power before I call you into what's next because I know you need that trust rebuilt. And then once God has given us rest, once he's given us rations, once he's given us a re reminder, then we can listen for what he has next for us, what he's reigniting us for. Because he doesn't just give us rest to say, okay, I'm done with you. He says, I gave you rest. I took care of you. I reminded you because I have another fire to light here in your life. I can't want to keep working. I think what we run into, it's, n it's nice to say, oh, yeah, God's great. He's going to give me rest. He's going to give me rations. He's going to give me reminders. He's going to give me renewal. But what we run into is... Two things. One, we sometimes start to think that we're, like, that we're expected to be like God. We're like, my fire shouldn't go out. I should be strong enough that I don't need rest. I should be strong enough that I don't need somebody else to take care of me and provide for me. I should be strong enough that I don't ever struggle with my faith and need God to build it back up. And we start to try to be God ourselves. And we forget that God said, no, you're a human I want to work through. And we can fall on that side. We're on the other side. On the other side, we can run into saying, God, what, what are you trying to do using me? I can't do it. And, we, and both of those lead to us not letting God actually provide and work through us the way that he said he wants to and he will. The way that we see in the life of Elijah. The way that we see in the life of Christ. There are times that Christ, who is fully God but fully human, and because he was fully human, there are times where we see that he was sleeping in a boat. He had to leave the crowd. He had to leave the amazing ministry he was doing to go sleep in a boat to go across a lake. And he was sleeping through a storm because he was fully human and he was created to rest. There are times that he needed reminders. When he was praying 
before his crucifixion, God, if there's any other way, please take this cup from me. He needed a reminder and renewal of what God was calling him to. And he sets that example of what it looks like for God to work in our lives. So I want to challenge you with, what I want you to think about, because I hate listening to an amazing sermon and being like, oh, that was so good, or an okay sermon and being like, that's so good. And then walking out on Sunday afternoon, I can't remember what it was about, which is fine. But then next Sunday, if I'm reminded of what it was about, I realize I didn't do anything with it. That I was encouraged by God, but I didn't actually let God work and change my life and help me grow. So I want you to think about is rations, rest, reminders, and renewal. And maybe you're in a moment where right now you're feeling like you're starting to hit some burnout. God was doing something amazing, but you're burning out now. And maybe you're not in that moment. So maybe you're thinking back to a moment. Maybe it was a couple years ago. Maybe it was a few months ago. Maybe it was in your childhood. But there was a point, I'm confident, in your life where God did something where it felt like an amazing bonfire. Maybe a little bit too much like the barbecue fire. And now, and then you remember afterwards struggling and questioning. And I hope you didn't go out and hide under a bush and ask God to kill you, but... I don't know, but you're struggling. What did you have the hardest time letting God provide for you? Was it your needs? What you physically needed? Your rations? Was it you had a hard time actually letting God give you rest and slow down and stop and say, okay, it's time for rest? Was it that you wouldn't let God give you reminders? You wouldn't say, God, I need a reminder to build up my faith. You just said, my faith doesn't work, but I'm going to keep going as if it does. I, mean, I don't have fa- enough faith, but I'm going to keep acting like I have enough faith because I, I'm just going to fake it until I make it. Maybe that you didn't have the humility to ask God to build up your faith. Or maybe you didn't have the hope that he would, so you didn't want to ask. Or maybe you struggled to listen for that whisper of renewal. Once God had provided for you, you just weren't listening for that renewal. So I want to encourage you to think about what one of those things would be. And next time that the fire starts to go down, you might be worried that it's going to get extinguished. You might feel already inside like it is extinguished. In what way can you rely on God to reignite you? I'm going to pause for about 30 seconds to let you think. Because I need silence to think sometimes, so I'll give that to you. All right. I hope that God has brought something to your mind, something to hold on to for the future. Think of the contrast between Moses' frustration and feeling like the fire went out and giving up and reacting in anger and rebellion to God versus Elijah and his humility before God. He didn't just wish. He didn't, it says he prayed to God and said, this is where I'm at. He didn't just wish, oh, I wish I could die. But he actually brought it to God with humility of this is where I'm at, God, working me. The whisper that God spoke to him on the mountaintop said, The Lord said to him, verse 15, Go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu the son of Nimshi king over Israel. And anoint Elisha son of Shaphat from Abel Mahola to succeed you as prophet. And God continues on. God didn't stop. The fire had been big, and the fire looked like it was extinguished, and God said, no, I'm going to care for you, I'm going to reset you, and I'm going to carry on what I'm doing through you and through the next generation. And when we have that humility to say, I'm human, but God has chosen to work through me with his spirit, and this is how he wants to care for me and reignite me. When he reignites us, he continues to... He may do something that's even greater than we've seen before in our lives, 
and he might use us to prepare the next generation. We always think of Elijah and Elisha together. But if Elijah had just burnt out there, he would never have passed on his leadership, his ministry to Elijah, Elisha. Who was stopped at Elijah, would never go out and pass on to Elisha. And when we dream of God working through our life and then working through our children's life, working through our life and then working through the people who are ministering under us, in our family, in our school, in our workplace, we think of God working in mission, but then passing that ministry on to work for, I don't know, 10, 20, 30, 40 years, not just right now, but into the future. And maybe it spreads out. It comes from letting God reignite us. Not going on never going to burn out. Part of being human, part of being who God created us as, is there's going to be times where we start to see the fire burn out. But part of being who God created us as, and living in relationship with him as he created us, is to let him reignite us and trust him in that. All right, I'm going to close this up in prayer. God, I thank you that you're so faithful. That sometimes... You work through a slow, steady burn like a Yule log. Sometimes we get to see you consistently work through us. And we're not worried about burnout. We're not worried about, am I enough? We feel your presence in that. But sometimes you choose to do things that are so far beyond us that we don't know how we can keep going, that we feel like you did something amazing, but that we're burnt up in the process. I thank you that you're faithful not to let go of us. That if we come to you with humility, trusting you as the good father that you are, the good shepherd that you are, that you'll give us the rest we need. You'll give us the care that we need. You'll give us the reminders we need, and you'll give us the renewal of the work that you have for us, in us, and through us, God. I pray that for each of us here as we face new challenges, as you call us into a new place, a ministry that we've never done before, that we remember your faithfulness and how you walk beside Elijah and how you want to walk beside us and care for us and provide for us to do things that are so far beyond our ability but are easily within your ability. In your name, Lord. Amen.